Good evening. I'm John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's public affairs program. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. Guided by the United States Constitution and the history and values of this great place, the Union League of Philadelphia, the Legacy Foundation endeavors to create better, more informed, more engaged citizen leaders. We do this through a variety of programs, including lectures like tonight, exhibits, publications, constitutional and civics education by giving college scholarships to tomorrow's citizen leaders, and again, through tonight's uh, programs like tonight's public affairs program. Uh, I want to thank, in particular, all those that make this happen, which are our donors. Uh, we exist only through the voluntary contributions of Union League members and others that share in the values and the spirit of this institution, the Union League of Philadelphia. So again, welcome to the, tonight's public affairs program. We have a really great uh, program tonight for you. And to introduce it is the Vice President for Activities for the Union League and a member of the Legacy Foundation Program Committee, Mr. Bob Cavalier. Bob. Thank you, John. Good evening. Uh, tonight's program is on the topic of China, and our expert guest is Gordon Chang. This is Gordon's second public affairs program with us, and we are excited to have him back and very much appreciative of him sharing his time and informative remarks this evening. Uh, to moderate our discussion will be the League's own Ed Terzansky. Ed is well known to the Union League and the Legacy Foundation communities. Ed has served the League in a variety of leadership capacities, most recently as a vice president. He is currently a, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Legacy Foundation. And as many of you know, Ed is a foreign, foreign policy expert in his own right. He has served in government and in the private sector, was on the faculty of Villanova and LaSalle Universities. Currently, Ed is the chairman of the board of Jefferson Health Northeast Division. I am pleased to introduce my good friend, our moderator for our program tonight, Mr. Ed Terzansky. With us, such a pleasure to welcome Gordon Chang, an internationally known and respected scholar of the Chinese situation, the internal politics and societal issues in China, along with China's foreign policy and its objectives. Gordon, welcome, we're glad you're with us. Well, thank you so much, Ed, and thank you to the Legacy Foundation for this event. So Gordon, let's get started. And um, you and I in our discussion on how we would frame tonight's program said, we're gonna touch on three big issues, but that doesn't mean that we won't stray from time to time. And certainly by way of the chat button, we welcome questions from the audience. So let's start straight off with this question. COVID-19 or the Wuhan flu, what responsibility did the Chinese government have in its origin, in how it was discovered, in how it was spread, and in how people were able to react to it around the world? Yeah, we don't know the origin of it. I mean, this could have been a zoonotic transfer from some sort of animal to a human, um, and this could have occurred naturally. This could have been an engineered virus that escaped from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And there's also a number of other theories about how this started. But the one thing we do know is how this disease spread from China to the rest of the world. You know, Beijing for the first time admitted that COVID-19 was human to human transmissible on January 20. But doctors in Wuhan, the epicenter, knew that this was indeed human to human, as they say, H to H, uh, no later than the second week of December. Now, some people even say that they knew about this in the fall, August, September, October, but clearly no later than the second week of December. Now, if China had said nothing from the second week of December to January 20, that would have been grossly irresponsible. But we do know that China tried to convince the world that it was not H to H. And indeed, the World Health Organization helped them with this because of this January 14th tweet, um, where the WHO said, based on information from China, there's no clear evidence that it is human to human transmissible. 
Now, that was really bad. But what makes this worse is that Chinese leaders pressured countries not to impose travel restrictions and quarantines on arrivals from China. And the WHO helped them in this regard with its January 10th statement. Now you put these two things together, that China lied about the human to human transmissibility, aided by the WHO, also tried to get countries to accept arrivals from China. And we have to come to an unthinkable conclusion that China deliberately spread this beyond its borders. Now, we don't know what Chinese leader Xi Jinping was thinking, but if after having seen what this disease did to cripple China, if he wanted to spread the disease elsewhere to level the playing field, he would have done exactly what in fact he did. So we've got to be concerned that this is not some sort of act of uh, negligent uh, release. This was something much worse. Gordon, uh, China also tried to score political points once the disease had spread, especially in Italy, by portraying itself as the savior who would bring in PPE, personal protective uh, equipment, along with drugs. And in many cases, what they sent out turned out to be defective. People complained that the Chinese were more interested in achieving a propaganda success than in actually helping. To what extent is this true? You know, certainly China tried to take advantage of the disease. And as you say, there was this mass diplomacy. Um, and indeed, some of the equipment that China supplied, the masks, the, um, the testing equipment was defective. Um, I, I'm not as concerned about that as I'm concerned about the malicious disinformation campaign that Beijing embarked upon. So we see from about the second week of February, the Chinese Foreign Ministry and the Global Times, which is a Communist Party tabloid, uh, really work to try to spread the notion that this disease came from someplace else. Um, so for instance, we have that infamous March 12th tweet from the Foreign Ministry, which said, look, patient zero for the coronavirus was in the United States, as well as that the US Army spread this to Wuhan. And China, of course, knew this was untrue. So this is the type, and, and they've continued with, with this disinformation. They're now trying to blame uh, Barcelona, Spain for being the source of this. this. This really is dangerous because what it tries is it shows that Beijing is going all out to lie about this and to basically not cooperate with the international community. Gordon, the most benign explanation for Chinese action is that they were embarrassed they tried to uh, avoid that embarrassment and any responsibility, so they lied. The other, much more nefarious explanation holds that at some point they said to themselves, wait a minute, we can weather this better than others, especially the United States. So let's let it go and do its worst. We'll come out on top in the end. Now, without giving in to the conspiratorial, now that I've mentioned it, what are your thoughts on those two possibilities? Well, you know, I'm sure that at first Chinese leaders were embarrassed by this and they were concerned that uh, China would be um, stricken by the disease and they would lose ground from a relative point of view. But we've got to remember that those leaders um, actually took steps that inevitably led to the spread of disease. So they had to know what they were doing. And so therefore that's responsibility. Um, these were grownups, these weren't third graders who were running China. And so I think that we have to understand that they knew the consequences of their actions. So that's why I say, look, this is all open source stuff. This is not conspiratorial. Just think about the implications of the facts that we know. As I said, I don't know how this disease started. There are conspiracy theories um, on that. Put that aside. What's important is not how the disease started. What's important is what happened after it started and how this disease jumped from China to the rest of the world. So Gordon, let's move from the virus and talk more broadly about issues having to do with US-China relations. And yesterday, quite coincidentally, Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI, speaking before the Hudson Institute, gave what was, by his own description, the most comprehensive e explanation 
and detailed analysis of Chinese counterintelligence, espionage, and industrial secret theft against the United States that any government official has ever presented. And I'll just very briefly read one of the statements the FBI director made, and I quote, it's the people of the United States who are the victims of what amounts to Chinese theft on a scale so massive that it represents one of the largest transfers of wealth in human history. What about that assertion? And then take us into a discussion of something that you've talked about quite emphatically, and that is the question of 5G technology, its wide applicabilities, the Chinese penetrating different markets, and what we should do to deal with it. The FBI director's assessment about the greatest wealth transfer in history, I think is right. Um, we know that China steals hundreds of billions of dollars of US intellectual property each year. Now, some people have said it's as much as 600 billion. Um, I think most of the estimates are in the three to $400 billion range, um, but whatever it is, um, you add that up year after year after year, decade after decade, and indeed the numbers become staggering because we're talking about trillions of dollars of technology that has been stolen. Um, so that really is the context of this. And, and of course, that's a grievous wound to the US economy. That is, as Director Ray talked about, stealing the future of the American Republic. Um, now we look at this across a broad range of sectors and 5G is only one of them. 5G is the fifth generation of wireless communications. Um, this is what people call the internet of things, which means that everything um, in your home, your office, your car is gonna be connected to the internet. And um, the concern is two. First of all, that China through its control of the internet backbone um, is gonna be able to steal um, all of this data and they'll feed it into their artificial intelligence systems. The other thing is that they'll be able to control all of these devices that are connected to the internet. So that means they'll be able to unlock your front door if they want to. They'll be able to drive your car off the cliff. They'll either turn off or speed up your pacemaker um, and they'll be able to do this if they indeed are the ones that supply the equipment for um, the world's telecommunications backbone. And that's why it's so important. And by the way, the US is so far behind China in terms of 5G. If we were to look at the beginning of this year, we were nowhere in this competition. Now, um, because of the coronavirus, because of what's happened in Hong Kong, countries are now starting to think that they cannot accept um, 5G equipment from Huawei Technologies, which is a Chinese company. Um, so there will be, I think, an evening, evening of the playing field, but nonetheless, this is um, you know, a battlefield between China and the rest of the world. And it's something that we can't afford to lose. Gordon, there's been an evolution in American thinking about bringing China into modernity and giving it a a front row seat in terms of the affairs of the world. First under Kissinger, it was a way to check the Soviets. And then during the Clinton administration, the thought was that let's trade with the Chinese. Let's give them full access to the international community through business. Because if we wind up doing business with them on a large scale, they will not want to go to war with their best customer. How, how do we assess that policy given what is happening today? It's been uh, a failure. It's been uh, the grandest wager in history and we lost that wager. Um, and now we find ourselves in um, a very difficult position because what happened is, um, you know, one can make arguments about the Cold War, about trying to side with China against the Soviet Union. But whatever one thinks about that bargain, and that's a very long conversation, Ed, um, one has a hard time justifying this after the end of the Cold War. Um, and that is really the problem. You know, for four decades, actually more than four decades, five decades now, um, we have tried to integrate China into the international system and we just completely failed. Um, and now we've got to change course. 
um, because China's a challenge to the United States is existential. You know, 131,000 Americans have been killed by the coronavirus. That is um, China reaching out and um, killing Americans. And so we have to understand where we are in all of this. You know, we've saved communism now a number of different times. Nixon saved communism in 1972 by going to Beijing. That was a Beijing that was weakened by the Cultural Revolution. Um, George H.W. Bush, after Tiananmen Square, rescued Deng Xiaoping, Mao's successor, by sending Brent Strokoff and saying, don't worry about US sanctions. Don't worry about what we say in public. We are going to have your back. We're going to save the Chinese Communist Party. Third time that happened, you had Bill Clinton, 1999, sign a trade deal with China, which became the basis of its uh, terms to join the World Trade Organization. Um, you know, those, those are times where we actually tried to rescue Chinese communism and was successful. And I believe that we should not be doing this again. Now, I know Kissinger is still influential um, and we'd like to hear what Kissinger has to say because it sounds good to the ear. It appeals to the generous instincts of humanity. But the point is communism in China, it's a militant regime that is unreformable and it's an existential challenge to the US. And so we Americans, We've got to come to a decision we don't want to think about. And that is, there's only going to be one survivor. It's going to be the People's Republic of China or the United States of America, not both. And so we got to choose which one of these two states is going to survive. Who is going to determine the future of the 21st century? And we've got to come to the stark realization, the realization we don't want to have to face, that we have to save our republic because our republic is at risk. Gordon, did we miss an opportunity to check the Chinese through, through the Trans-Pacific Partnership? That's a great question. Um, and there's going to be, um, that's going to be argued um, many times. And it's also going to be argued if, if Joe Biden becomes president. Um, I tend to think that we did miss an opportunity um, because the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a free trade agreement among 12 economies, on both sides of the Pacific um, did not include China. And it was established in a way that it would be very difficult for China to join later on. China joined the WTO, World Trade Organization. It, it really could not have joined the TPP uh, considering the nature of the terms. Now, I understand the counter argument that um, the US would do better in negotiating um, free trade deals one-on-one -on -one with other countries, um, but we haven't very, made very much progress in that. And in the free trade deals that we have negotiated, they haven't been really substantial improvements over what we had before. So my sense is that we would have been slightly better with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but I can understand that this was not an easy decision for any administration to make. And the one thing that, although I, I didn't like the way this came out, um, I do think that the Trump administration deserves credit for rethinking this because there had been a lot of people in the US who had just sort of assumed this free trade ideology and they just did not examine its, its assumptions. I'm glad that we're examining the assumptions, even though it, a decision came out not the way that I would have decided. Gordon, talk about Xi Jinping and his hold on power, what his thinking is about the United States and to the extent that you know, what he would, what, how he would view China's relations with the U.S. if it was a Biden presidency or a continuation of Trump's? Yeah, um, those are great questions. Um, first of all, I think that if, if you looked at the attitudes of Chinese officials through 2018, um, they were pretty unanimously in, in the view that the United States was on terminal decline and that China was going to dominate the 21st century. Um, 2019, last year, was a pretty bad one for China. So I think that some of those assumptions um, were actually being reassessed in Beijing. You know, Xi Jinping doesn't really care. He's, he's going for broke right now um, because he's looking for a victory. He's challenging everybody. This is a very dangerous period because um, I think that when you look at Xi Jinping's position in Beijing, it is one which is tenuous. Even though he's very powerful, it's tenuous. And, and I think we need a little context for this. So for instance, 
if we go back to his predecessor, Hu Jintao, generally considered to be a failure as a general party secretary, but Hu Jintao didn't have any adverse consequences for that because every decision made during that time was consensual. So nobody at the Politburo Standing Committee, which is the highest organ of the power in China, nobody got too much credit. Nobody got too much blame. Now, what Xi Jinping did was he took power from everybody else, so it's no longer a consensual system. And in 2018, when things were going China's way, when he looked to Chinese eyes to be kicking around the United States, this was great for Xi Jinping because he was the author of this. He was, he was given the credit. 2019, when things don't go China's way, Xi Jinping starts to get some of the blame. And we got to remember, he's got now um, because of great power, he's got great accountability. And that means that he is now considered responsible. The other thing that what he has done is Xi Jinping has, re has, re um, has increased the cost of losing a political struggle. So if we go back to Hu Jintao, if you lost a political struggle, um, you got a big house in Beijing. Under Xi Jinping, you lose a political struggle, you go to jail or worse. Who knows what happens? Um, and Xi Jinping knows this. So, uh, you know, when you combine two things, that you're responsible for debacles, and you know that if you lose the political struggle, you lose not only your position, but you lose your freedom, your assets, maybe even your life. That's the type of thing that makes Xi Jinping have a very low threshold of risk, which means that, uh, you know, what we're seeing recently this year with China's extremely belligerent and provocative behavior across the board, taking everybody on, this is, I think, Xi Jinping rolling the dice, looking for a victory and being desperate. Two-part question. To what extent does public opinion play a role in forcing the hand of Chinese leadership? And related, tell us about Hong Kong and the significance of what is happening there vis-a-vis the hold of the Chinese Communist Party on power and how it's portrayed within the country and then within the region? Yeah, um, political, uh, popular opinion means less and less in China these days. Um, not only for the reasons I just went through, but also because um, the political system is much more coercive than it's been in the past. And so um, voices have really been um, silenced. And we saw this like three or four days ago when the Tsinghua University professor, uh, Xu Zhongrun, was uh, scooped up and, and taken into custody. He was a Xi Jinping critic who had been pretty vocal. Um, so I think that essentially the regime, you know, Xi Jinping is just running on what he believes to be the right thing to do. Because I actually don't think that the Chinese people, if they actually thought about it, would endorse the policies that we have seen um, since this year. Um, you know, Hong Kong is is interesting because um, this is Xi Jinping was the um, one who had the portfolio on the Politburo Standing Committee for Hong Kong. He's the author of these hardline policies. Those hardline policies completely failed last year with um, protests of a million people, two million people in the streets. So what Xi Jinping has done, and this is typical Xi style, he's just brought the sledgehammer down on Hong Kong with this national security law which was enacted on June 30. And this is going to have consequences because if it doesn't work, um, Xi Jinping is going to be in a world of hurt um, because he's responsible for it. Everyone knows he's responsible for it. Um, he might get away with it. I tend to think that he won't, um, largely because we're seeing the United States, Britain, and other countries starting to impose costs on China. And those costs can be actually quite severe. So I think that this is going to be this is one of those tipping points where people's opinion on China have changed. It was sort of helped along by the coronavirus and the irresponsible behavior. And now with Hong Kong, it has become increasingly difficult to justify being a supporter of Beijing. And this really means that Xi Jinping right now is walking a very thin tightrope. Uh, Gordon, you used the word belligerent to describe some of China's actions and certainly neighboring states have complained about the belligerence of China. One in particular, India, comparable in size, certainly with a large military, also with nuclear weapons, recently um, suffered a horrendous loss of life on the part of its troops. 
And the Chinese really rubbed it in by trying to embarrass India in, in that border skirmish where uh, Indian troops were killed by the Chinese. What about Indian Chinese relations and the thought of the United States building upon what appears to be a very good relationship between President Modi and President Trump to maybe use an India card to play against China to the same extent that we did a Russia card against the so uh, or, or China, China card, card against against the Soviets. Yeah, um, China, I think, made a strategic error. Um, you know, it has there have been these border skirmishes for years and years in Ladakh and the Himalayas. Um, but generally what's happened, it really has been, you know, the Chinese would, you know, they'd come over the border and then they'd eventually leave. This time, as you point out, on the night of June 15th, they killed 20 Indian soldiers. And this has triggered a firestorm in India where uh, India just uh, three, four days ago banned uh, 59 Chinese apps, including TikTok, which has enormous consequences for Beijing. Um, going back to that discussion on 5G and all the rest of it. Um, but also really what they've done is they've made uh, the Indian um, state an enemy. And this is going to have consequences that we'll hear for years and years. Now, this is really magnified because India has some friends. Uh, it has Russia as a friend, um, though that's a little bit tenuous. Um, but it certainly has firm friends in what's been called the Quad. The, uh, that's Japan, Australia, India, and the United States. And those are powerful, that's a powerful combination. And that's much more powerful than, than China um, is or ever will be. And so really what they're doing is they're taking on the world. Um, you know, we're gonna probably see sometime this week, the United States ban Chinese apps. And that is, along with India, what we're doing is we're taking away the future of China's um, industry of the future. So um, I, I think that we're going to find um, that China has really hit, um, made a strategic mistake and Xi Jinping probably will pay for it politically. Gordon, the Chinese have practiced a maritime denial strategy, trying to keep the American Navy bottled up on our side of the Pacific and we've been pushing back. How effective have we been in pushing back against the Chinese? And what sort of actions would you want to see diplomatic, military, and economic to deal with China's aggression? Well, um, we have been moderately um, successful in deterring China in uh, its peripheral waters. Um, we have on certain occasions been spectacularly unsuccessful. Scarborough Shoal in early 2012, where we allowed the Chinese to take over a feature which was generally thought to be part of the Philippines. Um, this is a, just to give you sort of a sense of where we are, um, both Philippine and Chinese vessels crowded around Scarborough early part of that year, 2012. We brokered an agreement for both sides to withdraw their craft. Only the Philippines complied. China's been in control of this, this shoal ever since. The Obama administration didn't want to create a confrontation with China. And, and I'm not picking on them because they're not the only ones that made this mistake, but this is, uh, I think, the most important example. Um, so, you know, the White House didn't want to create a fight with China. So they just sort of let the Chinese keep the shoal. This is sort of like allowing Hitler to keep the rest of Czechoslovakia not permitted by the Munich Agreement. Um, and what happened? Well, China just went out and we emboldened the worst elements in, in Beijing because we showed everybody else that aggression worked. So within months of that, China started to reclaim those features in the Spratleys in the Southern portion of South China Sea, the artificial islands everybody talks about. China then put pressure on other Philippine features in the South China Sea most notably Second Thomas Shoal. And then China ramped up pressure on the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, which both China and Japan claim. So Beijing went out and made the problem bigger. So what we have done is we have taught the Chinese to ignore our warnings. Um, and this is an extremely dangerous time because we've now got to enforce our warnings. Otherwise they're gonna go all the way and take Hawaii. Um, and that's not too much of an exaggeration.
Um, so we've got to basically draw the line someplace. And every time that you draw the line, this is, creates great danger. Britain and France withdrew, you know, and basically let uh, the Third Reich do whatever it wanted, starting from the remilitarization of the Rhineland. And when they told Hitler in the summer of 1939 that an invasion of Poland would mean a declaration of war, we know that Hitler did not believe them because they had given Britain and France, London and Paris had given all these warnings in the run up to the Second World War in Europe and, and they never uh, made good on their threats. And so Hitler didn't think that this threat on the war over Poland was real. And, and as we know, it was. We're in basically the same situation. We are the Britain and France only of this decade. And we've got to now teach China that our warnings actually mean something. So this is an exceedingly dangerous time, um, not only for us, but for the rest of the world. So again, we learned that weakness is provocative. The Chinese have seized upon perceived weaknesses and chaos, really, the just COVID followed by economic problems, followed by social disorder in the United States. Um, is there any proof of Chinese participation in trying to add to our troubles domestically? That's a first question. And secondly, based on what you just said, how do we start to teach the right lessons and how do we build that coalition of states that can get across to the Chinese that their bad conduct is going to have a practical cost? Well, unfortunately, there is evidence that China has been um, trying to aggravate the problems since the death of George Floyd. Well, first of all, we know this because, um, again, the foreign ministry and the Global Times has engaged in a, a disinformation campaign, out and out lying about things um, and trying to um, stir the pot. So this has really been, been serious. This has obviously been malicious. We know from the New York Times reporting that since the middle of March, China has been propagating narratives that it knows are false um, through its bots and its troll farms. Um, and there's other disturbing evidence that we have yet to connect the dots. So for instance, um, the violent protesters outside the White House, um, one of them was overheard talking about doing this at the instigation of the Chinese consulate. Um, We've got to investigate that. Um, I'm not saying it's true. Um, it could have been a boast which was false, but nonetheless, we need to look at it. Just give you another example. Um, at the end of January, um, Customs and Border Protection seized $900,000 in counterfeit $1 bills in Minnesota, at a port of entry in Minnesota. Now, nobody, nobody counterfeits $1 bills for profit. These dollar counterfeit bills came from China, Nobody in China can actually counterfeit currency without the Communist Party knowing about it. So why was China permitting the counterfeiting of American currency? And why was it just one dollar bills? Well, um, I don't want to engage in conspiracy theories, but I think there's one line of investigation we need to look at. And that is essentially if you want to go under the radar, you want to fuel um, protesters and you don't want to get caught because nobody tries to look at $1 bills as counterfeit currency. No one investigates that. This is what you would do. Um, I'm not saying that China did it, but I am saying that China clearly permitted, this, permitted these bills to be counterfeited and to be exported to the US because that could not have occurred without the knowledge of the Communist Party. So Gordon, um, if you were advising each of the presidential campaigns in terms of what a package of American activities, policy prescriptions would be to deal with China. What sorts of elements would you put in there? Well, I believe that in the short term, uh, maybe even the medium term, the only thing that we can do is decouple from China. Um, you know, we have found um, through the coronavirus episode that China's Communist Party is not reformable. And that means that um, contact with it is dangerous for us. We have 130, 131,000 Americans who have died. Um, so we've got to do something. And it's obviously over the course of decades, we found that engagement doesn't work. 
So I think the answer is to disengage, um, to separate ourselves, get our factories out of China, not give China the leverage to influence American public opinion. Um, I know that this is not something that we Americans want to do, but I think that it is absolutely essential for us to do. Um, and so my package of recommendations for President Trump and for Vice President Biden would be to support um, a severing of the relationship with China. After we figure things out, then maybe we can actually think about how we can work. But let's just take one example. We know that China's ambassador to the United States, uh, Choi Ten Kai, was recently caught surreptitiously trying to recruit China, uh, American researchers for China. Um, this is activity which is inconsistent with his diplomatic status. And if it were President Chang, um, he would have been expelled. And indeed, the New York consulate, which was also involved in this illicit activity, would just be closed up because we cannot allow China to engage in these activities. We, and this is, this is an American issue, China has engaged in some very bad conduct on our soil. Really long conversation. Happy to go into it if you want. But the point is, we Americans have known about this, and we have permitted China to do this. So this is an issue of American feebleness as well as Chinese villainy. So my first recommendation to both candidates would be, you've got to start defending the American Republic. We cannot allow China to engage in these activities on American soil. Uh, Gordon, uh, just to go back a bit for the benefit of those watching, we have put a link in to the speech by FBI Director Ray, where he goes into some pretty significant detail about the sorts of things that you were just talking about. Uh, how do we get American businesses to wake up and realize that they've been facilitating the growth of dual use technologies and empowering the Chinese in ways that in the end wind up hurting this country? And at some point, they're going to lose their businesses because the Chinese will do to them what they did to everyone who purchased PPE when we were in, in the throes of dealing with that first wave of the virus. I know my, in, in the case of my own hospital, we had bought 300,000 surgical gowns and the Chinese pulled the ship back and seized everything we had purchased. The rules of the road didn't matter. So how do we impress upon American businesses that uh, short-term profit is going to lead to long-term disaster. The only way for that to happen, Ed, is for the President of the United States to use his powers under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977 um, to prevent, for instance, investment into the Chinese equity markets, to prevent um, you know, technical cooperation agreements that the United States has with Chinese entities to stop trade. But, you know, Business is amoral. Um, you know, business engages in some uh, a conduct which on its face um, undermines American national security and, and is really bad um, in terms of what business does. But you got to remember that business is amoral, that also business does not establish what are American national security priorities. They don't, business is not responsible for implementing US national security. So. Unless um, we change those incentives, um, they're going to continue to do what they're supposed to do, which is to create profits. Um, so to me, it's, it's a question of the administration um, exercising its powers um, to make sure that business can't do what undermines U.S. national security. This is going to be tough. I mean, this is something that is not really being discussed in the public square right now, but I believe that this is absolutely necessary. Gordon, which countries in the Pacific region would be ideal American allies to work together to deal with the Chinese on the entire host of issues going from economic to political to military? Every victim of China, which is basically every country in Asia, um, except for maybe North Korea and Pakistan. Um, but you know, these countries are our natu natural allies. So let me give you an example, Malaysia. Malaysia has had a very pro-Beijing um, approach towards China for decades. 
But even now, Malaysia is starting to pivot because of what China has been doing in the South China Sea um, in terms of prejudicing Malaysia's sovereignty. So China is driving countries away from Beijing. And so these are our allies. Um, so, you know, you look at you look at these countries um, and if you want to look at the most important, I would start with, for instance, India, as we talked about, but also Taiwan and Japan. You got to remember that for more than a century, the U.S. has drawn its Western defense perimeter, not off the coast of Hawaii or even off the coast of Guam. We've drawn it off the coast of East Asia and countries like Japan and Taiwan and the Philippines are that are our barrier. That's what protects us. So we need to make common cause with them. And, you know, while we were, we were talking about Hong Kong before, you know, with the kids in Hong Kong, the, the kids who fly the American flag and sing our anthem, we've got common cause with them as well because the, we've got a common enemy because the regime that is uh, on trying to undermine their freedoms and their autonomy is the same one that attacks our democracy every day. So let's work with our allies. We got a lot of natural friends in the region not because they like us, but because they are now so afraid of what China has been doing. Gordon, very specifically on Taiwan, what should we do by way of recognition and practical support, recognizing that the Chinese response will not be a good one? Yeah, well, you know, it's up for Taiwan to decide whether to change their name or to do other become instead of the Republic of China to become the Republic of Taiwan, which in Beijing would be considered to be a declaration of independence. Um, it isn't really because Taiwan already is independent. But if, if Taiwan were to do that, I think it's up to us to recognize them as the Republic of Taiwan. But in any event, I think the U.S. Um, needs to draw them into a mutual defense treaty. Um, Taiwan is really important. It sits at the intersection of the South China Sea and East China Sea. This is really the center of America's Western defense perimeter. But it's even more important than that, because in these days when China has been attacking not just our democracy, but democracies around the world and the concept of democracy in general, we can't allow Beijing to take over any democracy, especially one as important as Taiwan. So to me, what we need to do is to end this concept of or policy of strategic ambiguity where we don't tell Beijing or Taipei what we're going to do and we hope that keeps the peace. That might have worked in an era where you had Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao, but it isn't gonna work in an era of Xi Jinping who's an aggressor. And so we've got to make it crystal clear that we will defend Taiwan. Just to give you a couple examples, you know, Korean War, it was completely unnecessary. Korean War occurred when Dean Acheson, who was then Secretary of State, on a map in public drew America's Western defense perimeter and did not include South Korea. And before then, Kim Il-sung, the dictator of North Korea, could not get Joseph Stalin or Mao Zedong to green light an invasion of South Korea. As soon as Acheson drew that line, he got the green light from Moscow and Beijing, and the Korean War resulted, and that's 36,000 American lives plus two, three million Korean lives. Same thing happened with the Gulf War. You know, you had Saddam Hussein talk to our ambassador, April Glaspie. Um, she's, he asked her, what is your view of uh, Kuwait and Glaspie? And I'm not blaming her because she was acting on instructions. She said, look, America has no interest in intra-Arab disputes. Eight days later, Hussein uh, invaded Kuwait. So all those series of wars, the Gulf War, the Iraq War, completely unnecessary. And we could have stopped it with one word. If April Glaspie had said to Saddam Hussein, don't even think about it, because we will defend Kuwait, there would have been no invasion. Quite fine. So we have allowed this villainy to occur. So quite famously, it was Margaret Thatcher who told George Bush, don't go wobbly. And um, that's right. Help them find the backbone to push back. Gordon, you said a number of times, these are good questions. And I, I have to point out that uh, I've got cheat notes here. And these are questions that are largely coming from our viewers. Here's another one that I think is, is square on. So let's say we 
push hard, what are the possible consequences for the American consumer to all out economic war with China? And what's likely to happen if the Chinese go after an American aircraft carrier, uh, they keep on talking about having the capability to bring one down with a, a super missile. What happens if we wind up in a hot shooting war with China? So both cases, they're hot wars, different prices on each end. Yeah, um, we cannot think that we could maintain five decades of misguided China policy and think that we're gonna get out of this without cost. And as I talked about before, in terms of trying to convince Beijing that we're serious this time, uh, this is like one of the most dangerous periods in history. So we've got to understand that um, this is a time of peril. Now, I don't see any other way out of it because we could pull back, but we know what Beijing will do. I mean, this is, he's a clap, Xi Jinping is a classical uh, aggressor. He will just take more and more. So there is going to be a confrontation. And um, the sooner we do this in terms of trying to draw um, important lines, um, the better it will be for the United States and for the world. Um, we created, as I mentioned, um, a hostile China in a sense, or we at least permitted it to occur. And so for us, it's going to be a very dangerous time, no matter what happens. Um, I think it's now is the best time to do this. Um, there's no good time, of course, but uh, we got to remember that this is not, um, this, this is the result of some very bad policies, starting with Richard Nixon and implemented all the way through um, President Obama. So um, we, we did this with the best of intentions, Ed. Um, and, and I'm not saying that this is a partisan issue because it's Republicans and Democrats, it's liberals and conservatives. We Americans have just completely failed with regard to China. And so it is unlikely we're gonna get through this peacefully. I just hope that the Chinese state fails. Um, its economy is weak. Um, maybe we'll be able to get through this like we got through the Soviet Union, um, but we're gonna be very lucky if, if that occurs. Gotta remember, We've lost 131,000 Americans and the toll is rising. So Gordon, you've touched on two questions that are pointed out by our listeners. One is the question of the extent to which COVID has affected the Chinese economy, what is likely to happen. And the second, and this one I, I think is, is also quite philosophic in addition to being interesting, it asks, okay, the Chinese Communist Party disappears. What takes over afterwards? Okay. Well, first of all, um, the Chinese economy right now, I think, is weak. Um, the Bureau of, Na um, Bureau of National Statistics reported that the economy contracted 6.8% in the first quarter, which is the first quarterly contraction. These are year-on-year -year numbers. This is the first quarterly contraction since China started reporting quarterly GDP numbers. Um, it probably was not 6.8. You know, it could have been double that. We really don't know. I don't think the Chinese themselves know. Um, but we've seen um, this quarter um, mixed numbers. Um, April and May were um, really down months. June, I think there was a legitimate pickup. I think that Overall, there's a, probably another quarter of contraction. So this is a technical recession. I don't think China is actually gonna report um, negative GDP growth for Q2. I think they'd be too embarrassed. But the point is, China's got an economy right now that is export dependent. And so they, they, they have to deal with a Europe and, a, and an America that just is not buying their stuff. And that makes it very difficult for China to dig itself out of a hole because it doesn't have, it needs the help of countries uh, that right now are pretty skeptical of China. You know, in addition, it's got a debt problem. It's got all sorts of issues which are drags on the Chinese economy. Um, so uh, what this makes, uh, you know, this is perhaps the beginning of a solution, but also the problem is that if the Chinese leaders believe there's a closing window of opportunity, 
um, they have incentives to roll the dice and do something really dangerous. So what, what concerns me is that at now we have a number of trends and phenomena that I think in the mind of Xi Jinping lower his threshold of risk, which means that he can, he can basically surprise us because he can act in ways which are exceedingly bold and dangerous. Remember, his hero is Mao Zedong. Uh, and Mao talked about striking out at everybody at once, talking about chaos and all the rest of it. And indeed, Mao was an aggressor himself. So we have in Xi Jinping, I think, the world's most dangerous figure. Uh, Gordon, what's if from a perspective from the perspective of the Chinese, whom would they prefer to see in the White House? Do you have any sense? Yeah, I was hoping you weren't going to ask that question, because uh, this is actually a little bit complicated. Um, both President Trump and Vice President Biden have vulnerabilities on China, um, but I believe that at their core, there there is a difference because Trump has been skeptical of China for a long time. Uh, this is not something which is politically motivated. This is something that he actually believes. Whereas I think Biden actually believes that we should be um, working our best to help China. And we heard that last May uh, when Biden said, uh, China's not competition for us. Chinese leaders are not bad folks. Um, when President Trump imposed the travel restrictions and quarantines on arrivals from China on January 31 of this year, Biden was the first one out of the gate to accuse him of uh, xenophobia. So I, I do believe there's a difference. The one thing that, that people don't focus in on is that um, I think right now is a critical time for China. If Biden were elected or if any person were elected for the first time, they would do what Trump did in his first years in office, and that is try to build a cooperative relationship with Beijing. We would be saving Chinese communism again. And in addition, the Democratic Party of foreign policy establishment is very pro-China, is very pro-engagement. It's like all the events of the last couple of years have just occurred and these guys have had no, it's had no effect on them. So I'm afraid that it's not Biden himself. Uh, it's the people that he would bring in as his advisors. Um, so um, Trump is well into his campaign of defending the American Republic. If he were reelected, uh, which doesn't look very likely at this moment, but if he were reelected, I think that he would go for broke. He would continue what he's been doing since the March of 2018. And that's a good thing um, for him to do that. Gordon, leave us on the most optimistic point that you could make in terms of American responses to the challenges we face with China. That the Chinese people decide that they've had enough and they get rid of the Communist Party and institute a multi-party democracy from day one. That ain't going to happen. Would uh, uh, it's not going to happen now? Would you um, maintain access for Chinese to the United States? Allow Chinese to come here in sufficient numbers so that um, they could develop relationships and become uh, inured, if you will, to life in the United States and try to export that home. Well, as as the son of um, uh, someone who came from who fled China, um, you know, I'd like to say yes. Um, and, and ultimately, that is a, a, the general approach. Problem is right now, we have yet to come to terms with um, Chinese uh, nationals in our country who have been spying for Beijing. Um, and this is not only Chinese students, but Chinese engineers and all the rest of it. We got to get our hands around that um, before we think of generous policies. Um, that's unfortunate. Um, but we Americans have done a bad job, uh, as Director Ray said yesterday at the Hudson Institute, um, as you, or at least as you can hear, as you can think from what he said, we've done a very bad job in protecting ourselves. Um, so we've got to, that's job one. Job two is building those links with um, Chinese students and others. Uh, how does the Chinese military stack up against ours? Um, well, overall, uh, it's not as strong as, as our military. Um, they're ahead in certain areas like uh, intermediate range missiles because we were in the INF treaty and China wasn't. 
But, you know, where it counts, Ed, um, in a theater of conflict off of China's coast, um, China has uh, the ability to bring more assets to bear and has the advantages. Um, so we've got to be very concerned about that. We um, have allowed our military, uh, we spent a lot of money on our military, but we have not spent it wisely. And um, that means the Chinese military is much stronger on a relative basis than it should be by now. I think that we're seeing, um, at least in the Trump administration, movement in the right direction. I mean, they, they, they junked a whole class of ships, the littorial combat ships recently. That's a very good thing. Um, but, you know, they're still making mistakes in the Pentagon. They're still spending money on the wrong stuff. Um, so this is, this is not a good story for us. If there's any optimistic note, I think it's terrific that the president created uh, the Space Command, um, you know, a, a, a new branch of the military. Um, that's very important for us because um, the next conflict is going to be won or lost or almost won or lost uh, half an hour before it begins. And it'll be won or lost in space. Um, Olympic Games. Do we go? Do we, um, if China is hosting the games, do we go? I think they're, they're slated to have it in two years. Yes. Um, and they should have never been awarded the games in the first place. I tend, you know, and this goes back to Jimmy Carter's boycott of the Moscow Olympics, which uh, was maybe the right thing to do, but it would have only been the right thing to do in conjunction with other things. Um, so I think that the boycott of the Olympics was not advantageous for the United States or the West then. I tend to think the same now, um, but um, I think that, you know, in terms of the way we, we approach the Olympics, uh, we should be working day and night to make sure that there's not another Olympics in China. And indeed, my, what I'd be doing is try to move the Olympics out of China between now and 2022. Gordon, this has been a fantastic hour. John Mika has appeared on my screen, so that tells me it's time for us to go. But on behalf of everyone at the Union League, thanks so much for Zooming with us. And I can't wait to see you at the League in person so we can have some milk and cookies. Uh, I know many Union League members want the same thing. And thank you so much for the public service you performed in helping well, thank people you. understand the challenges that we're facing. Well, thank you so much. This has really been a fantastic event. And so I really appreciate uh, your questions and the, uh, the League Foundation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Gordon. John, Miko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ed. Thank, thank, thank you, Gordon. Gordon. What a, what a great, great program. program. Uh, uh, Gordon, Gordon, again, as Ed said, we can't wait to have you back, back here at 140 South, South Road. Hopefully, hopefully that will be very, very soon. soon. Again, again, thank, thank you, gentlemen, gentlemen for a great, 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 great uh, uh, program. We really appreciate it. Uh, so, so just, just a few other housekeeping items. items. We have more virtual, virtual programs uh, on the way. Uh, next uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, I believe, July 14th, we, we have a library hour with Trudy Coates. We'll be, we'll be talking about Newport, Newport mansions in Newport, and all the great architectural wonders and the connections between these mansions and Union Lake. Many, many Union League members uh, had their, their summer homes there, there, there and many were built by Union League member of ours, Trump Trump Bauer, who also built this fine building, building that I'm in right now. And then, and then on July 22nd, 22nd Harold Knudsen uh, will, will be talking about Confederate uh, uh, General Longstreet in a Civil War Roundtable. And we have, we have a really interesting public affairs program that we're putting together with Lee member and sports broadcaster and reporter Harry Donahue on COVID and the sports outlook for the fall. Great panel of uh, national and local personalities and leaders in the sport the world of sports, and, and uh, we hope to announce that full panel uh, in the next eight days. That's on July 29th. So we, so we hope to uh, see you on our, our next uh, program soon, and of course we hope to see you in person. Uh, we hope very, very, very soon. Good night. Have a wonderful evening.